Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Councilman David Baer, or excuse me, Chairman David Baer, and I'm calling this uh, TDC meeting to order April 13th at 3.04 p.m. Welcome, everyone. Uh, first order of business, I would like to introduce our new uh, TDC member, Mary Hoxing, and thank you for your service. Mary, everybody normally does like a five minute speech if you wanted to say a few things. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and also, I want to thank Nan Harper for uh, her years on the TDC board uh, and her service to Scambia County. Mm -hmm. I know she was recognized at the last county commission meeting, um, and I just want to thank her again. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment? Uh, now is the time. We don't take public comment during the agenda uh, throughout the item, so if you have an item you'd like to discuss, uh, now would be the time. Great, thank you. Um, so approval of the February 2021 TDC meeting minutes. Uh, we just got an updated copy that you should have received. Um, and if, does anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, we'll entertain a motion. Move the minutes uh, as, so, as so in the new edition that just got to us. Yeah. Yeah. Second that. So we have a motion, a second. Is there any discussion? It, it, it was. Um, so. Don't say anything about cutting the district. <laughs> uh, the, I think the idea was that, um, that the, yeah. It, it went to the oversight <laughs> agencies. I, I just wondered what he was doing. Any other comments? If not, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. So moved. Thank you. Oh, yes. So if, if you're going to speak, please turn on your mic and speak into the mic. And anyone from the audience who comes up, please come and speak at the mic as well. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Sunshine Law presentation from the County Attorney's Office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Steve West with the County Attorney's Office. I'm here to give you your annual uh, Sunshine Law and Public Records Act uh, refresher training. It's not intended to make you experts on either one of those laws. It's just uh, to remind you that you are subject to them uh, in your service here on the Tourist Development Council. I'll start off with the uh, Sunshine Law. Uh, the purpose of the Sunshine Law is to preserve the public's right uh, to observe legislative decisions being made. Uh, and not just the decisions, but also the deliberations that lead to those decisions. The Tourist Development Council is considered a sunshine board, so you are subject to the sunshine law. And it specifically applies anytime uh, two or more of you are participating in a meeting uh, on some issue that either will become, come before the board for a vote or, or might possibly come before the board for a vote. Um, meetings are very broadly defined under the Sunshine Law. Uh, it's not just what we're doing here. Uh, it could be any uh, exchange of information between board members, whether here, uh, outside of the meeting, through emails, texts, telephone calls, uh, anything like that could potentially be considered a meeting for purposes of the Sunshine Law. Uh, if you are going to have a meeting, uh, in order to stay on the good side of the Sunshine Law, you have to make sure that three criteria are satisfied. Uh, the first is that you have published notice of the meeting uh, so that members of the public who want to participate will know when and where the meeting is going to be held. Uh, second, uh, you have to have the meeting in a location like these chambers that can accommodate members of the public who might want to attend. Uh, and then last, you have to take minutes of the meeting and make them available 
uh, to members of the public who uh, might, not got, might not have uh, received the notice or have uh, had the opportunity to attend the meeting. Uh, that way they still have the uh, ability to understand what was discussed and what was decided by the, uh, by the board. Um, if you run afoul of the uh, Sunshine Law, though, um, you can be subject to some penalties. Uh, removal from office is one. Uh, fines up to $500 is another one. And then the worst uh, would be six months, up to six months in jail. Um, so that's pretty serious. Um, that's pretty much the Sunshine Law in a nutshell. Um, the problem I see with the Sunshine Law, though, is that even though it's kind of simple, um, it's very broad in its application, and um, it prohibits conduct that is, in most other cases, pretty benign. Um, so just to leave you with a couple of examples of how you might find yourself inadvertently in violation of the Sunshine Law, just to keep those things in mind um, as you go forward. Um, let's just say that maybe an hour from now you decide to take a, a recess and just adjourn the meeting for a few minutes so everybody can stretch their legs, go use the restroom. Um, if two of you decide to maybe continue your discussions sort of off to the side, sort of informally while the meeting's been recessed, well, that's not been noticed and there's not necessarily, you know, availability of the rest of the public who might want to participate in that and there's no minutes being taken, so you may be violating the Sunshine Law to do something like that. Um, you all kind of circulate in social circles and business circles, so you probably know each other maybe outside of of your service here in the Tourist Development Council, maybe you run into somebody at a social event or maybe a Blue Wahoos game. Um, it would be natural for you to make small talk and sort of have your conversation stray into things that you have in common, like service in the Tourist Development Council. Well, if you start talking about tourism issues, then you could inadvertently find yourself in violation of the Sunshine Law. Um, even sitting where you are right now, you could potentially violate the Sunshine Law. If you're uh, communicating with each other, um, even during a meeting, maybe by text or email, maybe making some hand gestures below the dais where members of the public can't see, thumbs up, thumbs down, um, that could be a potential violation of the Sunshine Law. So just understand that, it's again, it's very broad in its application and conduct that's probably innocuous and kind of benign in other situations may inadvertently lead to a Sunshine Law violation. So my recommendation to you is, unless you're seated where you are right now, don't talk with each other or otherwise communicate. If you have to, though, stay away from the tourism issues. Uh, and last, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to call our office. If I'm not available, anybody up there can answer your questions on su Sunshine Law issues. So. If I have no other questions uh, from you on Sunshine Law, uh, I'll move on to the Public Records Act. Um, the Public Records Act, the purpose of it is to preserve uh, the public's right uh, to review any record that's generated in the course uh, or of business or received in the course of business. Um, like the Sunshine Law, um, with meetings that are very broadly defined, records are very broadly defined under the Public Records Act. Um, a record can be anything, a document, traditional eight uh, by eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, um, but it's also texts, emails, electronic records, could be videotapes, audio tapes, again, anything that's generated or received in the course of public business is considered a public record. Um, there's exceptions, you don't need to know about them, they're very limited, um, and there's too many of them to discuss here. So. Um, just consider just basically anything that you generate or receive in the course of your service in the Tourist Development Council to be a public record and call us if you have any questions. Um, but if you do have a public record and the public wants to look at it, the public can, part, can, can look at it. Um, they don't need to go through any sort of a formal process. There's no requirement that they make their request in writing. They don't have to give a reason. Um, it's enough that someone simply says, I want to look at that. If it's a public record, the only delay that's allowed under the Public Records Act is just what it takes to, uh, to compile the record and make it available for their uh, inspection. Um, 
if you don't make that record available, then the penalties for, for, for not complying with the Public Records Act are similar to the Sunshine Law. So my, uh, my recommendation to you would be don't have public records. Anything that you get or generate in the course of your uh, service here, just turn it over to the clerk um, and, and, and let her be the custodian of that. The county has a system set up for that to you know, download that and make it available and respond to public records requests, but if you don't have anything, you can just say, see the clerk. Um, I'll take questions if you have any. If not, thank you very much. Yes, I, I have one quick question. Sure. And maybe it's for the administrator. Um, all the TDC members use our own personal email addresses, mm -hmm. except for maybe the commissioner. Uh, and um, I think it would be easier if we could each have our own email address through the county so that all of those records, all the documents, emails back and forth uh, are contained within the system. So mm -hmm. I know we have to retain our own documents at the end user, but that way they're searchable through the county's email system. Sure, that's, uh, that's probably something to... Um, I actually spoke to our folks about that today because we have two other boards that are interested. Oh, um, when I was on the Island Authority, we had Island Authority email, and I 100% agree with you. It's much easier to manage it from there. And so I've asked them to check and see what that would look like. We have about 40 boards and commissions. Not all of them are as active as you all, so they might not necessarily want it. But we just had to look at capacity and, quite frankly, how to manage that. So not everyone's asked, but I, we just had that conversation today. Sure. So. Thank you. It, it is a little bit easier to, to pull public records when the county is the custodian of them. Yep. Yes. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next agenda item is the status of funds available, TDC collections and receipts, clerk and comptroller's office. Good afternoon, everyone. How are y'all? Great. So um, if you guys kind of remember my, my fund report starts with the blue, the blue uh, page, and we'll, we'll go right to, uh, to the revenues and expenditures page. So these, these numbers are reflective as of March 29th, 2021. I do have the, the current numbers as of um, yesterday as well for the revenues, um, but so we, as of March 29th, we had uh, $4.2 uh, million so far in collections. And, and uh, our total March collections as of this report was 555,000, but we only had another two days. So it went up to 567,000. And then so far in April, we've collected 161,000. <clears throat> which we typically see um, the revenues jump substantially, usually right around the 20th of the month. So don't be alarmed that the 161 sounds low for the first uh, 12 to 13 days of the month. Um, as for our expenditures, still on the, the first uh, page with the revenues and expenditures, we had 2.3 million uh, so far out of the first three cents paid to uh, Visit Pensacola and the Bay Center has had uh, 1.1 million allocated to it so far. We've had um, 123,000 um, used for indirect, uh, or for the administration, for the 3% administration costs, and we've had 28,000 paid for beach mowing and 266,000 paid for uh, Bob Sykes. That's where you kind of see the 294,000 where it says one through three cent BCC beach mowing of Bob Sykes. Um, out of the four cent, we've had 116,000 paid to Visa Pensacola, um, 56,000 paid for administrative costs. Um, that beach projects, that $30,000 that you see is the UWF water assessment for, uh, for the Vibrio bacteria. Um, testing the water to make sure that it is uh, clear of this bad bacteria that makes people really sick. Um, and then we've had 128,000 so far paid out of the four cent for marine recreation, and then another 50,000 paid um, for out of the outside agencies and tourism, which out of that 
50,000. We've had uh, 10,000 go to the African American group, and we had 40,000 go to the uh, five flags for the fireworks. <clears throat> so um, for our cash balances, we would have the uh, 5.8 million um, available, and you will see kind of where you see the difference between our cash balances and our fund balance. There's that $9,200. That is a, uh, a retainage fee for um, the Bob Sykes toll bridge. So that really kind of summarizes the, the entire revenues and the expenditures. If we wanted to flip to the next page, which is our revenue trends. <clears throat> the, our revenue trends um, so far are for March, we're down about 5% compared to last year, but we're stu still doing very well in comparison to 2020. And like I said, the March number final was 567,000. And so far in April, it's 161,000. So if we keep going to our cash reconciliation, which is the next page, that reflects everything that we were just discussing with the rep, the, our, all of our cash balances, revenues minus expenditures equals our, our fund balance. Um, which reflects everything that I, I kind of went into a little bit deeper on the, um, the revenue expenditure reconciliation. And all these numbers tie to our, um, you guys should have also got a financial support package from me, which I think was about 17 pages if I remember. And all those numbers tie back to, uh, to these reconciliations. And for our last item is our um, adopted budget. Um, the only thing that has changed on the budget from our last meeting is that we um, reduced the county administrative costs, which I think we were, if we remember kind of at the beginning was overstated based off the revenue. Um, so it has now um, been reduced to what the 3% should have been. So th that's really kind of the, our status of funds available and, and where we are rolling with our revenues and expenditures as of March 29th. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I do have a quick question. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so the uh, Sertoma, the 40,000 I think it was from the fourth cent, is that correct? The, yeah, the five flags? Yeah. Is that yes, what you sir. said? Yeah. Yes. Yep. I thought that was gonna, is that part of the unified budget? I thought that was it, part of, I didn't think we were gonna the, fund them. It's, it's not, I thought we decided that like two years ago. We did this past year though, because to make sure that the money went to the, to the unified budget, the we BCC took, took it under their fourth cent. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions or comments for the clerk? No? Just to okay. clarify, Ronnie, that's, that's with all of these outside, these BOCC outside agencies, all those would typically have come from the percentage that was allocated to the unified budget. Right. Um, but the, the BOCC took it out of theirs instead. That's fine, okay, I just wanna make sure. When when does the fifth cent start? It, it started April 1st. Okay. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> and so all the collections, so right now everyone's collecting the money at the higher rate and it will be remitted to us May 1st because everything's uh, the one month behind. By May 20th, right? That's By May 20th, point. and it, it would be delinquent after May 20th. Great, right. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Uh, can I just ask, a uh, Madam Clerk, and I apologize, I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this yet, but I, um, usually you do break down the one through three and the fourth cent, so I hope that um, it's possible for us to um, be able to have an apples to apples comparison to show what the, the four cent collection was uh, compared to the four cent from the year before, uh, and then the fifth cent would just be added to it just so we can continue to compare historical data. Yes, sir, I, I've, uh, I've already prepared something for that. Okay. So it, it, you'll see a apples to apples comparison, then I have a graph that'll show the additional percentage, so it'll be really easy to follow. And I guess for, for me, it's it's the packet that we usually get um, for the board um, that has the bar graph, you know, so you can mm -hmm. show it over the last five years, and, and I, I would um, hope that we can, can see the trend analysis on just the four cents and, and then start another one with the cent.
I, I mean, I've got it at the board, but the, the rest of the board may be interested to, to see because it's a, a bar chart that shows the, the last five years. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, and, and we and also have yeah. and we also have one by uh, zip code, so you can kind of see where. Yeah, I've seen that on the, the okay. clerk's website. Yeah, if you don't mind yeah. adding that to our, since you've already created it, just yeah. add it to the packet. It'd be my pleasure. Great. I, I think if if we can just whatever the board gets for their backup is probably would be a good thing to come to to, to this board. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and and then like I said, if we can somehow create a an, either a new chart showing the fifth cent or or have it shaded a different color to represent the fifth cent, that would be um, helpful. Absolutely, it'd be Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next agenda item is Pensacola Bay Center discussion. Uh, board member Patel asked to add this to the agenda. Do you want to speak to it? Well, I had just seen on the, I guess the Board of County Commissioners meeting, it was on the news that the Bay Center had come back to, I guess, request additional funds. And I didn't know if that was maybe because of the fifth cent now being approved and coming or what exactly that was. And I know the last meeting we discussed where SMG had actually spent some money on the, the Bay Center. So I, I didn't really understand what the ask was or what was coming up or how much they needed or actually anything. And, and I mean, we got 700 pages of information. So <laughs> I didn't know all of, if they're taking TDC funds why have we, me personally, I've never seen anything from the Bay Center that shows where they spent the money, what do they spend it on, who approves it, how's it get spent, and obviously there's a loss every year, so I would like to see that, and that's what I asked for, and that's what the 700 pages is. I've went through like 50-something pages of it. Um, uh, so that, that kind of was why I had asked um, for that information. Okay. Thank you. So I... So Cindy is here and she's gonna present every single one of these pages to us. <laughs> um, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Commissioner and, and Cindy, uh, the, the Bay Center or AS, ASM Global has asked for additional support from the county uh, because of COVID and their losses being shut down. Uh, they've cut um, significant expenses as well to offset some of their their losses in revenue, and so they were asking, from what I understand, it was 870,000, 877,000. The county staff had reduced, negotiated that down to 350,000, and then the Board of County Commissioners allocated them at their last meeting $100,000 from tourist development tax, but that would then be replaced with some of the, the federal stimulus money when when it came in. Uh, but the the I think the discussion went on that they were gonna provide all of this documentation to the county commissioners uh, for their upcoming committee of the whole meeting discussion to readdress the the outstanding uh, request for the additional funds. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, so, I see Cindy uh, nodding yes. So. Yes, so uh, the original request was, was 877 um, through meetings with the administration. Um, the, the request to us came forward at 350. Um, and it was to, to come from um, TDT reserves. Uh, given the uh, discussion that, that we've had here recently about uh, TDT funds being, being spent without not just TDT approval, but without maybe the knowledge and knowing that this meeting was gonna be after, uh, I looked for additional funds that we could use uh, for that and uh, came up with the Recovery Act money that we're, we're supposed to get that um, everything indicates right now based on the, the legislation, that we would be able to use it towards that, that fund. So we essentially took a loan out from TDT um, that would be repaid with that money once it's received, so it wouldn't come out of the, the TDT. Uh, we do have a discussion on, on this Thursday to, to talk about um, uh, going beyond the $100,000. The 100000 got got us through the end of this month. Um, and, uh, and and what it would take to, to continue operations for the rest of the fiscal year. And then you're, so you're saying that the recovery fund would cover the hundred that's already been given, and possibly the remaining balance, two fifty or eight seventy seven. I, I don't think the eight seventy seven is in the discussion. We're we're looking at the additional two fifty right now. 
Okay. But yes, it, and, and but still, um, unless the TDT wants to to talk about that, but uh, my again, I was focusing on uh, on the on the Recovery Act funds that we could utilize for that instead of having to come back to the TDT. Commissioner, was this a, uh, additional allocation to what had been budgeted previously? Is that what you're saying? It is, yes. Uh, I think we we've um, we had done it before, not done it before, but uh, I think there was some discussion that two years ago, I think they, they got like an extra $400,000. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and our discussion on, on Thursday, we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that they undertook. Um, yeah, of course, they've, they've had furloughs and, and laid off some people. Um, I would say it was, it could have been difficult not knowing um, uh, when events were going to resume. We had uh, hockey that started in December, um, but you know you had a concert I think rescheduled four times, and, and so there is some cost incurred as you start to ramp up in preparation for that to have them cancel two or three weeks before the event. Um, as I said, as it relates to hockey, uh, the cost to operate a hockey game to get the ice on the floor um, don't change just because you can only allow 50% of the people in the stands. So your revenues cut, um, your food and beverage revenues get get cut um i mean granted they fewer staff working the gates and things like that but uh, you know the majority of the cost just operators are still there um and and so the question is is, is do we continue to operate we had the sunbelt conference championship which i think uh hopefully we'll, we'll hear some on that later on uh, i think it was uh, sunbelt felt that it was a, a great experience and i look forward to it next year with having the three mile bridge uh, open and and COVID restrictions lifted, um, and and show them why they've they've really made the right choice in, in coming to Pensacola and Escambia County um, to have their conference championship. So, um, of course, they had to ramp up for those uh, activities, and um, and I, I think we as a board have supported the Sun Belt Conference uh, championship coming here, and and um, that's uh, part of the cost of, of doing it. Right, thanks, Mr. Reeves. <clears throat> So you came up with a good idea for the 100. Where do you think the 250 is going to be paid from? I would ask that it come from that same Recovery Act money. It was just the, uh, the, the board only moved forward $100,000 to, um, to get more information and, and dig deeper into the numbers before we uh, granted anything else. So it should be revenue neutral to our funds? Yes, sir, it should. Assuming the federal government comes through, I mean, you know. <laughs> any other questions or comments, Bay Center? Commissioner, do you know if that two fifty or three fifty it, it, is is there a, is there a limit on the recovery fund that the federal government is doing, or are we just kind of? I think we have a seventy-two million that we have coming in. Estimates have us at about 60 million. Okay. Um, we have, I've checked Treasury every day. We've checked NACO, we've checked FAC. We have not gotten the, the, um, the letter from Treasury that we have to sign that say, yes, Escambia County did have COVID. Um, so we have to submit that. And what they're saying is they'll submit to us the first half, which will be about 30 million. And then 12 months, no earlier than 12 months from that, we would get the next 30 million, but the funds are available for till 2024. And the only guidance that we have is that the words tourism and hospitality are in that uh, language for that particular piece of legislation. That's the only guidance. Everything else just says pretty much you can spend it on most things that a government does with the exception of lobbying. So other than that, I don't have strict guidance. Right. Um, we have just as, a, just as a note of information, we did connect the SBDC with Cindy and her team to see about the venued uh, the shuttered venue uh, grants and applications. I think everyone's still working through whether or not they would apply for that. So that was part of our conversation with them as well, was to see if there was another pot of money that their organization might be able to apply to for those federal funds. Okay. And, and yes, that was, uh, I was about to mention that, that uh, we did talk about applying for that. There are some, um, some of the, the regulations or stipulations in it um, uh, uh, prohibit if, if you're welcome, if you want to talk, you're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, I was going to invite them up. Yeah. I would like to speak and address. 
uh, Tony Sima, uh, ASM Global, Senior Vice President of uh, Arena Stadium Theater Division. Um, the shuttered venues program, uh, yes, ASM as a corporate uh, corporation does not qualify, but we are there as we are through a number, uh, probably 90% of our venues, we're there to assist uh, putting the application together because of the requirements so far that have come out uh, of what is being required, we're, uh, we're able to help put all that information together for the county to apply. And then that would either be in lieu of or uh, of the other funding that we're... That's that, right, that it would be in addition to, yeah. correct. Right. And Going through the SBA though, it has been, it got cut down from a higher percentage, which I believe was 70% of gross um, of what your previous year 2019 gross receipt gross receipts were to uh, I think I believe it's down to 45 percent now through the SBA and I don't know if this is the right question for you but so if the 877 you guys can't get that let's say you only get 350 what's that mean for the, so the 877 was originally asked worst case scenario didn't have any other events that's where the 877 came from. We then came down and provided a, another number of 493 initially. We've added some events, we've worked that number, and that number's come down to 423. The county then came to us and said, what can you do with 350? We then have put together another plan with 350, continuing to cut down on the staffing numbers, the furlough amounts that people are uh, setting up a plan where uh, the employees are on one week, off one week, um, but still being able to host the events that we already have contractual obligations for. Um, and then being able to keep the building open so that we are able to continue to uh, contract new events, which would then help drive down that debt even further. And that number covers all of 2021, right? Is that what you're saying? Through, through September, yes, sir. Okay. Through, our, through our fiscal year. Okay. Through the fiscal year, correct. All right, thank you. What is, what is the capacity right now of the Civic Center for you to do an event? <laughs> I mean, is we are dependent upon what the local mandates are, whether it's the county, whether it's the city we fall into the city so we generally use the city mandate um, we go back to janice we ask all the time uh, how do you want to proceed as we get asked by uh, promoters or event uh, that are out there looking for places to come what is your percent capacity cindy will go to the county to janice and say hey they're looking for 75 percent they're looking for a hundred percent capacity how are you feeling about the event being in October? Right. Can we be at 100% now? We're finding that a lot across, uh, across the country where depending on where you are geographically, obviously different um, municipalities have different thoughts on what their capacities can be. Just up the road, Jacksonville, we have an event in um, uh, two weeks, USC event that is at 100% capacity. Um, Texas Rangers had an event 10 days ago, 100% capacity. Now that's outdoor stadium, understand that. The arena in Jacksonville is completely indoor and that will probably be the first sporting event under 100% capacity um, that's happened. That has to create a challenge for you for booking something for October to guarantee that they can do 75% not knowing what the local mandates would be. So we include language in the contract that allows us to work with the promoter depending on what the mandates are at that time sure. so that we can either reschedule, postpone, or move on from there if we're not at a certain capacity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I, 
Yeah, I, I would mean, just say it's, it's something we're working with. Of course, there are, of course, some acts and venues that are not going to tour until um, more facilities are at a certain number of percentage. It just doesn't make financial sense for them. Um, and those are probably those, those bigger events that we, you know, maybe we don't see, but we would like to host. Um, we're trying to get you some. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but um, it, it's things like, um, um, uh, again, just, just the family concerts, the, the monster jams. Um, and we, did, we were able to do the rodeo a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, but, of course, the, the cost necessarily to operate those events doesn't go down that much but your your revenue is, is severely capped sure. uh, and I think that's the discussion uh, hopefully they have with the board is is uh, is, uh, is that something that the that we're willing to support as a community so that we can have this venue uh, as we lose venues like New World Landing and and things like that um, our our options to, have to host events um, becomes limited and and, and so that Personally, that's, I think that's the, the value of, of the Bay Center is, is to, to have those. I do have a couple questions moving forward. Uh, is, the, is the city involved in, in this help at all, number one? Number two, I would think that the largest consumer here in Escambia County is the school district for graduations. Number one, will, do you guys anticipate graduations this year for the school yes, district? Yes, we have uh, eight booked. How many booked do we have? Ten? Ten. So we're, we're hosting uh, both Santa Rosa and Escambia uh, County High School graduations. We'll have seven Escambia graduations uh, and three uh, Santa Rosa County graduations. We're also May 9th hosting Pensacola State's graduation. Right. Uh, UWF has moved uh, their their uh, thought process again, talking about the different thing or ways of thinking about how to deal with it. They prefer the outdoor environment at this time. Great. Do you have other questions? So to answer your first question, the answer your first question is no. The city is not. <coughs> Yeah, still. Correct. And, I asked, and, and I asked that question. It's a redundant question. I actually need the answer, but I ask it every time we talk about the base center because, I mean, uh, at some point you would think that everybody would want to incur the cost if everybody is enjoying the amenity here in Escambia County. But seeing where it's more of a cost than an income, I'd be happy to share it with them. Um, they actually offered yeah. Yeah. yeah they, we were, we were going to make a, a, a trade. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were going to take the libraries. They were going to get the base center. They didn't take it. Um, but but it is an Escambia County-owned facility. Uh, we, we do own the base center, the building itself, and, and that's why it falls under our... Um, I know. So, I but Mr. to answer your question, um, are you happy with the 350 if you get it? <laughs> yes. As opposed to the other option, yes. Okay, we're very well, happy. we're very happy look with at, the 350. Look, look as at it this to what way. We could get. As far as we're concerned, we're happy for you to have it. We believe you have these additional expenses. We just don't want you to take it from us, you see. I, I, <laughs> I understand that. Yes. One other additional question, real quick. So, if we, if, so are we holding the graduations to different types of capacity? Is that what it is as well? Well, I believe the capacities are being driven by the schools themselves. So, so we, kind of, yeah, that's they're, kind of they're interesting kind of right? telling if the schools us can do it, then certainly that's right. right we they're telling get. us what they want the capacity to be. So if we, so if they're telling you what the capacity is, would mm, who is setting the regulations for concerts then? Because it seems uh, like it's kind of a well. Right now, it's the county. So we go to the county and ask them. Gotcha. We have somebody that wants to play at 100%. Are you comfortable with that? They go, well, okay. maybe not 100%. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I'd be more than happy yeah. to show you that. Sure. Yeah. So about, oh gosh, I'd have to look at the email, but it's probably been about four or five weeks ago. Yeah. Um, sending them asked, hey, do you think we can go to 100%? Sure. I think in the fall. Correct. And And that was whenever vaccines were coming on, and we were, and at the time, I think the president was saying May 1st, we ought to be doing really good, you know, like that. And so, um, I said, I asked our staff, I said, what do you think about 75%? Because we weren't really sure. It's been, sure. like I said, about a month ago when vaccines were really starting to get heavy across the country. Um, and then, so I guess about three, two or three weeks ago, I asked him, I said, hey, can y'all, ASM, can y'all get us a chart of like where the people are um, in the state of Florida? Because yeah. you don't want to be the first one, because sure. if you're the first one, then you know, who knows what's going to happen with that. Okay. But the other thing we asked was to look along the touring. So maybe somebody going from Atlanta to Dallas, do they stop yeah. in Pensacola? 
you know, South Carolina to, to New Orleans, do they stop in Pensacola? Look around the region and see. And so they provided us yesterday with a chart from all over the country, okay. where their venues are, what percentages they're at, and when they're going to a higher percentage. So I'll give you an example. <coughs> Tallahassee's on their list. Um, and I don't know that that's one of your facilities, but Tallahassee um, is only at 25 to 30% because FSU owns yeah. it. And um, they won't be yeah. going to more than 25 or 30% until probably June. So I just got this yesterday, and we're looking at it. Um, you know, the good news is at the 50%, they do have this concert at the end of the month that's already 400 tickets with them being sold out at the 50%. And I think right. Cindy said they're fixing to add another show. So that's great news. Now, I'm sorry that we couldn't go to 100% first time around for the, the performer and entertainers, but I would say the end of April <coughs> might have been a little too soon anyway because of, you know, May was already the original date. So okay. we just got this yesterday. We meet with the board on Thursday. I want to make sure the board is comfortable with the decision. We were already leaning 75 to 100% starting September, October, okay. but given this information, we may be able to move that up quicker. Okay. So thanks, Dan. If you uh, don't get enough money, uh, we want you to check with this board. For what? For the graduations. Oh. <laughs> is, is Santa Rosa County paying for the graduations? Yes. yes. Oh, great. The other thing I would just if they comment have along, the same, yeah. along those same lines <laughs> is the um, first aid. Uh, for the hurricane. Yeah, so we had, we had shelters that operated we had, uh, uh, of course, that was open for a while. I think uh, Zeta, we, I think we opened it again. Well, I think uh, we did three times, right? Yes. Twice. Twice. Yeah. yeah. So, so all half. that to say is that we've, we've used yeah. it as a county, um, and, and they incur costs to operate the, the, um, uh, the shelters um, to, to maintain the services, just to, to look for the building. And, and so those are, again, all costs that were incurred at our request to to open it as a, as a shelter for, for those needing it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments about the base center? No? Great, thank you very thank much. You. We appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you for being here. Uh, next item on the agenda is the audit and agency update. Um, the There's nothing in the packet about this, but uh, um, last Friday afternoon I sent out uh, the letter that you guys, that this board authorized me to send to the oversight agencies, um, well, addressing uh, the expenditures of, you know, what would, were considered unauthorized. Uh, and um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about the letter that went out. Uh, we can discuss, Mr. Bender. All I want to know is who made that motion? <laughs> Well, Mr. Bender, did. I, I, Commissioner I, Bender, and, and that's the thing. I, I'm happy to to, um, to to confirm that we are spending it in the in the right way, or if we need to, to adjust our our ways, um, I think that's that's prudent. David, uh, of course, as we just learned, I can't talk to you about this outside of this, so that's why I'm, I'm bringing right. it up here. Um, but the five percent indirect administration charge retained by the board, can I, I'm not aware that we've done that in at least the last three years, um, and and so is that the um, so I'm trying to confirm what that is. Well, that was what I was told that the county generally retains it uh, in all of, from all of their uh, pack. So are you talking about the statutory sources. set aside, the whole back? No, it was for the indirect costs. The, the county retains a portion of the funding for indirect costs. I've asked for an uh, allocation program evaluating the cost of uh, administering the program for from the county not the clerk you're talking about the county right uh, and what that is and there is no program there's no policy related to it uh, I, I put in there five percent because I was told that's what the the county has generally um, used for administration okay and, and if, if we can get some clarification because I'm not aware that we've been doing that okay um, and I mean I mean just in, in trying to think about what we piled through last year and all the expenses I don't recall seeing uh, an indirect administration charge in any of in any of those, um, and so uh, I know at at some point a number of years ago we were we were over the three percent and uh, to however you want to call it, and I think Jack worked it out or, or said okay we'll we'll step it down, um, but I was I was not aware of this practice and so that's why I, I wanted to 
uh, if, if you were aware of something, then I wanted to make sure that, that I was knew about it to address it because I did not think it was being, being done. And, um, and it may not be anymore. Okay. I, I, I wasn't aware. I was asking uh, because we have some, there's, you know, one to three cent BCC reserves slash projects at $746,000 that has not been described in the budget, in the approved budget. We don't know what that is. Um, <coughs> and uh, we don't know whether or not that is good to be used for indirect costs. We don't know how much of the marine resources is considered indirect costs uh, and what that total amount is. When I asked what, what the amount was, uh, and over the years I've asked, uh, generally speaking, the county has retained 5%. Commissioner Bender, can I give you some facts based oh. on your comment? Okay. There is a 5% statutory holdback that's always in your budget, and that is Would good fiscal for the hearing impaired. The hearing impaired. Hearing impaired. <laughs> there is 5% on your budget. I don't have any of that information in front of me to tell you every year, but 5% is customary for a statutory holdback. But I thought I would tell you uh, the actuals on the administrative and the indirect. It's totally different from a 5% statutory holdback. Right. Ms. McClure, OMB director, commented to you that the cost allocation plan to her departments is 5% based on a plan that is not charged to grants or TDT. That is county practice. I made a comment that that's their practice and federal practice is 10%. So let me give you the actuals. This started with the chamber in 2013. The actual was 4.1. There's administrative and indirect. So up to 3% and then whatever they seem deem over an indirect expense. That's 2013. 2014 was your transition year, 4.5. At that point in time in that transition year, there was a lot of time being spent by this county administration and they tracked their costs to be 4.5. The next year was a full first year of Visit Pensacola and it was 4.1. The following year was 4.1. In 2017, it went down to 3.6. In 2018, is 3.0. In 2019, it was 2.4. In 2020, it was 3.0. I will tell you the last three years didn't even cover the actual administrative cost. The county chose not to cover the rest of my indirect, nor did they cover theirs. The Auditor General will allow them to go back and collect cost, should they choose, I can't remember if it was Okaloosa or Walton, but you've read the studies, you've provided the studies. But I thought it might be helpful for you to know the real, what, what's on our books, what's audited, and what's factual. Thought that might help your discussion. Thank you. Will you provide a copy of that for everyone? Uh, uh, yeah, let me see. And let me copy. ask a question. All those percentages, were you speaking about the 5% or were you speaking about the 3%? Okay, 5%. Take that out of your mind. It's, it has nothing to do with you. Just take it out of your mind. Nothing Why? to do with you. What? Why? Because there's a 5% statutory holdback in the budget that is a budgeted number and it's held back and it's revenues that flow through and stay in fund balance. They just stay in fund balance. But you're talking about cost. Right? This discussion is No, no, is about no. Cost. I didn't want you to get to cost. I want to get back to kind of what is said in the letter is it can be up to 5%. That's not my letter, and I won't agree that that's factual, but I didn't so, write the letter. So if you've got all these costs, then you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be, uh, concerned about a I'm third party auditing those numbers. I'm not concerned at all. By all means, I called the AG, I, Auditor General. I called them to look at this. I talked to them about my allocation. I talked to them about the county's allocation, the five percent. I, by all means, we're an open book. I just thought you might want so, to look at, know the actual and understand factual 
what statutory, what they do for the departments is totally different than statute 2112 and 125. So I, I think what we're really talking about are three separate pots here. Mm -hmm. You have the 5% statutory holdback, which, which when the budget comes out, we just take 5% off of what we expect to collect just as being fiscally responsible that you don't spend 100%. That way, like we did last year, that was 5%. We didn't have to cut from somewhere else because we, we hadn't allocated it towards anything. At the end of the year, that gets put into the fund balance and- And you can reappropriate right. as a commission, Which, not as a council, as a commission. But, but that's just confusing the issue. This letter only addresses the 5% administrative and the 3%. Correct. That just clouds that so we're nobody's arguing so no one's that. arguing that so i was but but the the five percent um administration charge um is what it's an it don't confuse the terms one is called an administrative cost one is called an indirect the county charges an indirect cost because it's called an indirect cost plan that's the world we live in it's never charged to grants or tdt and as a i'm just going to charge you five percent they are allowed, they, the county, are allowed to charge TDT revenues indirect cost, and there is no cap in the statutes. However, they adopt a plan. When they have a plan and they can show the true cost, they can charge against the TDT revenues. I can charge up to 3%. My cost, just in my look back for three years, my costs are at least four. So I've always known I'm at least 3%. The county OMB finds comfort in putting in their budget just 3%. That's what they've done the last three years because they know my administrative cost alone is 3%. My indirect is higher. Their indirect is higher. They chose through, an, through a gentleman's agreement not to charge the TDT revenues any indirect cost over the last several years. It's just what they agreed to. And that was going to be my question. So uh, uh, number two of your letter, I don't think we've collected any of any. Of, that's that 5% indirect administration. I don't, I am not aware. Not so, over the so. last three years. There was a small percentage, 3.6% was in 2017. Okay. So you can say 0.6, th there was probably just a lot of work going on with Amy and Stefan at the time, and that's what they agreed with. Jack, okay. I think, was here. So, so we, we do the 3% statutorily that we're allowed. Up to 3%, and I have the backup that I provide. Right. Yes. And then the other side, we do zero, even though we could go, even though for other departments, we go up to 5%. And right now, let's say DOR came in and said, county, what do you typically charge for, for indirect cost? You would have an indirect cost plan that you adopt. And in general, it's 3%. There are some departments that are up to 14. They could be very high because they are needy departments. And they may, I believe, and Ms. McClure can answer this, I believe in this cost plan, they are asking specifically for TDC, because I think they'll consider, especially given this this conversation, if they want to charge it or not. They haven't been. So, so speaking of facts, what the statute says is that the clerk may retain uh, a portion of the tax collected mm -hmm. uh, for administration, which yes. may not exceed 3%. It doesn't Correct. say 3%. Right, and I, I charge 3% because right. mine's usually four, so right. I can show that I've earned at least 3%. Right. Thank and you. I, then I can charge more under the 212 statute that says indirect. So I actually could compel the county to reimburse me properly for all of my cost, and I, as a clerk, could charge you 4.5 just for my cost then they, the county, could do their indirect cost plan specifically for TDC, and they could charge for their indirect cost. Right. Chapter so, 12. So, so the Auditor General has also stated that those percentages, in order to retain and use those, mm -hmm. uh, the tourist development tax, that you have to actually have a cost analysis done showing the actual cost to administer the program. And yeah. We've asked for that. 
Well, this this board has asked for that for the last two meetings. And I've they've asked answered for it in you. The, excuse me. And I've asked mm -hmm. for it in emails, uh, but we have not received that. So we haven't received it in a packet. We haven't received it in a presentation anywhere. So uh, that's why this board has asked for an audit. That is why this board has authorized me to write a letter to the oversight agencies, mm -hmm. because we've been asking for this information and we have not been given it. So if it does exist because it has been created, then the transparency and, and presentation of that information could have saved us a lot of time and a lot of discussion over the last two meetings. But we have not received that. So I, and I understand what you're saying about you could do the indirect costs and you can. It has, there is a cap. The cap is what it actually costs you to administer the program. And indirect costs have to be calculated. There has to be policy from the county uh, in order to authorize it uh, and collect it and use it. And so without that information that we have asked for, uh, then we've had these long discussions and we continue to have them. I believe uh, I've seen in emails to you, Chair Bear, that you were told that they have an old cost plan that they're getting updated. They we were told that there was rely. a software that was going to be they, used and then at the last meeting, Ms. McClure said that not until probably the end of 2022. And that's the updated cost plan. Right. So I believe the county can share with you the cost plan that they rely on and have relied on for years. Can the but, clerk's office also provide theirs? For the three percent administrative fee? Absolutely. Okay, that that would be great. That would Absolutely. Be really I mean, I've told what I told you last meeting and then meeting before is that I have a spreadsheet. I don't hard code it, nor do I turn in specifically a TDC budget to the county. I turn in a clerk's budget. But in fact, you know what? We're right here. Let me just tell you what I turned in. Three percent. So, 3% for 2020, my direct cost is 341,594, my indirect is 119,667. For 2019, my direct, and there's backup to all this. And is, Madam Clerk, is this the TDT portion of it or is this the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, no, okay. this is just TDT. I, I, it sounded like you see you didn't break it out, so these, yeah. are, these are broken out numbers. Yeah, though. I just don't provide the county and the back down so you asked me do you have it and I said I do it's not just this simple thing that I do because every year changes depending on how it's managed who's doing it what kind of projects we have so year by year we do a budget the comment was well do you have it way back I'm like I don't know because I remember I sat down with Amy and did it with her and we carried it forward I believe was the answer that I gave you that might have been the answer, but we never received a copy of it. So we never received anything that you're using to calculate your administrative fees. Well, we'll wait for DOR to come in if that's who you would like to substantiate it. I can email it to you. It's, it probably needs to be more in a final form because it's not the prettiest thing you've seen. Well, it's not bad. I think you could understand it. Okay. Yeah, it's there. So, Just David, all that to say, I, I really wanted to check with you about the 5% item two in your letter because I wasn't aware we were doing that. And, and so it, it was more for clarification on, on, on my part because I, I, again, I, I try to pride myself that I know what we're spending our money on and that this board's aware of what the money's being spent on. Um, and so that was just a practice I, I wasn't aware of. So um, it, I, I, just real quick, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so there is one for the county. The county's got one, a spending plan like that, that they've used previously. Is that what you're saying? They have an indirect cost plan. Yeah. A city does one. A county yeah, does sure. one. That's how they charge but, departments. But, but I th yeah, absolutely. And I think that, uh, I thought we asked her last time, Ms. McClure, and she said that they hadn't had one, but they're working on one. They so if they do have, have one now, they just plan. shoot the other one over that they used years ago. Yes. And we can use that. I mean, if you guys send it over in an email currently, we can look that over in the next couple but, but of days. But what they're saying is that back again. Yeah. They don't that's not the clerks. That's not the clerks. But Ronnie, they don't yeah. charge it to the TDT, to the TDC. Oh, so the, so then they don't have. That's Could I, they have one, but, but it doesn't apply they, to the, the TDC. TDC. Okay. Could that's, I ask I just one to make sure. question, okay. Pam? Is Amber's salary included in the administrative <laughs> costs? Not mine. <laughs> uh, my real question is, what is one percent mean? In dollars. In other low. words, 
if you really should be charging three and you're charging five, what does 1% mean in dollars? 100,000. So, I mean, I'm, this I'm guessing based on, I had to make some yeah, assumptions. Yeah, this discussion to is over 200,000. So, what you're suggesting is we take it from the turtles. <laughs> right? Sure. But yeah, I, I, I have the calculations. I believe I've reported to you that I have calculations. They're not real clean because I, 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 my clean one is the budget. It's all provided through the budget. If that was not a po uh, given to you, my apologies. Maybe you write a lot of emails. You ask for a lot of things. We're checking, and it's usually Friday night at 4.55, I think this one came. So sometimes it is a little quick and demanding to have to the next meeting. Well, that wasn't a request. That was a copy of the letter. The request it, it was, was several I, months ago. I agree, but a lot of times your requests are, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do my, so if I miss something you ask for it, I'll get it to you, and if DOR or AG or whoever comes in here, I'm an open book. But I would like to keep, I wish the letter was a little bit more factual, but that's okay. I mean, we can, we can work through it. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Mr. Reed? Honestly, how much, assume that a, the letter is correct as it relates to nesting turtles and the marine. Uh, I just added up the number of dollars that you outlined. I mean, how much is that in dollars if they were completely wrong in what they spent it on? Well, as far as the administrative and indirect costs, I don't know because I haven't seen an allocation plan. No, 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 I'm talking but about But the, the other room. the other items, uh, they allocate 317000 this year, uh, and a portion of it I do believe is an authorized use, uh, but we don't know what portion. 100% uh, of Robert Turpin's, the director of that department's, Salary and benefits and expenses are all paid out of that. Uh, and I don't believe he does 100% of his job is, is tourism development. So whatever portion that is and all of the other expenses in that program, uh, and not just this year, last year, but moving forward, if it continues, it's grown over the years. For the last three years, it's three or four years, it's doubled the amount that goes to that program. $125,000 to Landscaping, uh, there were $75,000 worth of um, ATVs that were purchased, uh, $25,000 truck. So those, all of those expenses add up, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars that could be used I to develop totally tourism. Agree. And if they're not spending them for the right thing, you know. And, and Chair, if I may, I, I believe we did discuss the landscaping before we, as a Board of County Commissioners approved it last year. Um, and the thought was, was that uh, we could do better out there and and the way to do that was to uh, to hire somebody to do it and allow our public works crews to focus on other needs of the beach repairing things um, there were some some walkthroughs that that weren't being maintained and so to uh, uh, the the whole idea was that we we uh, strongly or, or strictly manage um, the contract and make sure that everything that we expect for them to do is laid out. Um, and, and part of that was that that's what the tourists see when they, they come on the beach and, and driving through the beach and, um, and we want to try to put our best, best foot forward. Um, and I agree those things need to be maintained, but that doesn't make them authorized uses of the tourist development tax. I, I understand that, and that's, again, why I support the letter, to make sure that, that they are being spent accordingly. Um, but, but I think, I, I can't recall if we voted on it as a board or not, but I, I felt that there was support for this board to, to move forward with that allocation of money. Mr. Reeves? Do you know whether or not, who pays for the irrigation system? Is it that? Santa Rosa Island Authority, or I, I believe it's it's uh, it's us now. Public it's Public Works. Is that? I believe it is us. The county. The, the county. 
Uh, yeah, I believe so. I think the county took it. It's all the ECUA affluent. Yes. That's being installed. They, they did throw those up. They put those other lines down. Any other, any other questions or comments? No. Not. We will move on to the next item on the agenda. I can't see without my glasses. I've lost my agenda. Um, yes. Uh, federal stimulus money discussion. So I, I, I asked to add this to the agenda um, um, related to the uh, American Rescue Plan funds mm -hmm. that yeah. administrator was just talking about, that's yeah. 60 million bucks. Yeah, and so actually um, Zanani did a fantastic job of taking an analysis and then attaching the actual bill. If you are very interested in reading it, it's an interesting read. I mean. It's kind of sad in some ways because of how much money has been spent around the country, but on the other hand, it's an excellent example of how you can take an analysis and then attach the actual legislative language. We're more than happy to provide that to you all so you can see the information that we have at this time. And I know where you're going. One of the things that you're concerned about is, uh, one of the things that is mentioned in there is that when you have a loss of tax revenue, um, you can uh, pursue those kind of funds or utilize those funds um, whenever you get them. The only instance in which you cannot uh, encumber those funds is if you make a legislative change which then uh, uh, enables the loss of the revenue, the tax revenue. But I don't foresee that happening. Right. Unless you want to reduce down to like two cents nope. TDT, I guess. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> but so we're more than happy to provide that to you. We're also, right. Zanani's helping me track with these agencies, uh, NACO, FAC, these other U Department of Treasury. Once we get guidance, we're more than happy to provide that to you as well. Right. Um, so we are trying to stay on top of it. And what I've shared with you is about all that we have at this time, which is just information. Supposed from, to get. Yes, yes, checks in the mail. Right. So, well, and that was part of what I wanted to discuss was once the check is received, uh -huh. if received, uh, because of the loss of revenue and the tourist development tax mm -hmm. last year and the major mm -hmm. cuts that we had um, from a budgeted, what was it, two, 12, I can't remember what we originally budgeted, um, but we, the prior year, we had received uh, almost 12 and a half million in, mm -hmm. in collections, uh, and then we ended up with less than 10 million in collections mm -hmm. this year, but it was cranking up mm -hmm. at like a, I think it was like an eight and a half percent increase, 19 mm -hmm. over 18. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at possibly another increase mm -hmm. for 20, which mm -hmm. didn't happen because of the pandemic, but mm -hmm. uh, between 19 and and 20, it was a, a loss of two and a little over two and a half million dollars of, mm -hmm. of tourist development tax mm -hmm. collected. Uh, if you look at where we should have been based on that anticipated growth that mm -hmm. we had been seeing year over year, that eight and a half percent, uh, it would be more like $3.6 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would like, uh, if this council is interested in having this discussion, asking the county to uh, put a portion somewhere between the two and a half million and 3.6 million we're three for three point six is what I'd like. I, I know what you'd like. Um, well, uh, can I can I ask this question though? Yes. Because what I think what I would like to do is I'd like to have data and I'd like to have um, some kind of analysis. Yeah. I think that we should look at. Oh, oh, uh -oh. Jesus. You okay, Pam? You okay? Are you okay? She's good. She She's got right back up. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like to do an analysis of the last several years. And I'm not, I'm not talking about during the recession, but right. as we're going through the budget, looking at, so we're actually doing a lot of analysis of revenues um, and, ex, and actual expenditures, um, and then also revenue projections versus actual collections. I would like to do that analysis to see if we can determine probably a real good number. So I know you're given a, a, a corridor there. I'd like to give a hard number Yep. But I would like to do it based on maybe five or six years of analysis to yeah, see. Yeah, that'd be great. Because there might be different percentages year over year. If yes. that's okay, that would be my recommendation to yeah. look at. Yeah, absolutely. Because okay. I, I do know that in prior years when the, the, the collections were lower, we mm -hmm. were cranking at a higher percent increase. So mm -hmm. looking at them as an increase uh, percent-wise mm -hmm. uh, could be even greater than this. If well, I would just like to provide analysis. that analysis to the board so that they could see... I, w I would just like to have a reason 
for the percentage, right? Yes. Instead of, okay, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. Anybody have any comments? So where, where were you? Uh, I, I would say we'd try to put that in reserves if we, if we get that. Is, was that where you? That was, uh, yes, if that can, if they can be put into reserves, that's what that, I was going to ask. Otherwise, yeah, I think that would be fantastic because you've all have mentioned it. that before. Yes. And it would be something that, I hate to use lockbox, but it would be something that, because y'all all were very disappointed last year when we had to go through this exercise with COVID. And so I think this would be a good way to hopefully not have to maybe and, not go through this again. And I, I think our only um, qualification is that we would have to spend it by uh, 2024, right? Yes, yes, but I mean, there's probably so we, a way to, you can, to we manage can spend that. it and then Put reserve the collection. Right, yes. yes. Yeah, yes. because like, yes, yes, I would Tish, say if they treat this I like did. other funds, yeah. And so the, the 60 million amount you had quoted before, does that include the number that the chairman's talking about? Yes, it's okay. not a, it doesn't appear at this point that it's a separate pot we would pull out of. It would be part of the first 30 or the second 30 million. Okay. So you could, that's why I would like to see what the number is because then you could help us decide with the board um, what if we do it over each year, you know, over four years, because like I said, we get two chunks, 30 right. million and 30 million. So it, you may decide at that point that there's a greater need now, but we need to go on and maybe find a way to secure that we do get X number of reserves. That's our goal by X date or something. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. What does Wesley know that you don't know? What do you mean? Well, he's next on the agenda. Uh huh. So I want to know what he knows that you don't know. Oh well, he works with dip he works with our community groups. Um, he's over that particular silo. So we're ready for him, right? Yes, sir. You ready? <laughs> before we before you move on, are you, gonna, are you gonna make a recommendation that we do that moving forward with the reserve on that money? Or are we gonna are we gonna put that in the minutes, or what, is this just a discussion on it at this point? Or are we gonna? At, at this point, I wanted to have the discussion with M Madam Administrator and okay. and the council. Okay. Uh, but that would be my interest when we get to a, a point uh, that maybe we get to take action because we've received some funds uh, that and, and that would, it would go to reserves. So go ahead, James. Why don't you make a motion that's that we exactly, come back to you at the next board exactly meeting with I'm that analysis say. so that you'll yeah. have a number that you that's can recommend yeah. as we're going through the budget yeah. process we'll to the commission. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, okay. I, I make a motion that just what she said. Well, he already moved. Well, he's already moved. Second. Good, second. good. Second, and let's move it on. Before we go so, on, though, wait, to Wesley real quick. Hold on, wait, any, yeah. There's a motion on the oh, there's floor. A, so any other discussion? discussion? discussion. Holy yeah. Go ahead. Any discussion? Yes. Yeah. The only discussion I'd like to make is that uh, on the east and west of us, both counties are all the hotel owners are very glad that our bridge is out. So I would say don't put it in reserves when the bridge is open and next year we need to try to get those customers back to our area um, because they probably have gotten and are very comfortable in Gulf Shores, Destin, Panama City, and it's gonna be hard to bring those back. Um, so I just think the added extra advertising later this year or next year is gonna be desperately needed. And if I'm, I, I think Robert? that's that's probably why our, our board said that the fifth cent would be 100% towards the unified budget mm -hmm. or minus 3%, whatever, you know, that it would, it would be spent towards that. And, and that, yeah, I mean, the idea is, is that you've increased theirs considerably by, by doing that. Right. Would you, I mean, do you agree with that or? Uh, I would, but I would still, I, I hate when things get put in reserve because then that's a reserve that could get spent on anything else. I'd rather it be bit spent on marketing and advertising once that bridge is open and we need to attract as many people back to Pensacola as we can because we're losing a bunch of them to Gulf Shores and we're losing even more to Destin and Panama City. And, and I don't disagree, I guess my concern though is, I mean, we don't expect to have another year like last year, but if we if we did, then we would then have something to where visit and everybody could, could hopefully keep their budget as opposed to cut, you know, 15, 20%, what was the final number, Darren? 20 percent yeah overcut 20 percent. i mean that's that's the idea is, is that yeah correct me if i was wrong i'm wrong yes, though but I, I thought we said we had to use the money by 2024 and we were going to keep it in reserve year after kind of 
Well, what yeah. we're saying though is that we right. could we could budget more of the reserves from the collections for this year right. and then use that as operating. That's correct. So it would get spent, but, correct. but it, would it would be would offset. Spent. Yeah. Right. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the motion was to ask the administrator to come back with the analysis yeah. so for next meeting. So we're not talking about correct. what we're doing with it today. Right. And that's just so we can ask. Yeah. That's the ask yeah. portion once yeah. you bring it back. Okay, before we move on real quick, I do want to say, uh, uh, oh, Actually. do we still have a vote on this? No. <laughs> Any other discussion on the vote on this motion? Yes. Uh, if no aye. other discussion, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. So moved. So Thank moved. you. Real quick before we move on, uh, Madam Clerk was kind enough to provide exactly what she uh, said that she would provide to us, but uh, she doesn't have to kill herself in the process to do this. We thank you so much. Yes. This, this should not be a contact sport. Yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for providing this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, my agenda is gone again. How about Wesley Hall? Yes, new business, Wesley <laughs> Hall. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Thanks, ladies sir. and gentlemen. I'm going to be I've brief because I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. When we talk about resources and the management of resources, it's critical and very, very vital to me. I grew up in Fort Myers, Florida, and I went to high school not very far from Sanibel and Captiva Islands, which I spent a number of summers there going shelling with my parents. I also, you know, resided in Tallahassee for a number of years, and this is my second stint in, in Pensacola. And I know the resources that we have and how critical they are to our tourism industry. And I compare that to a story. I, I, I went to Houston one summer for vacation, and uh, my relatives were out there, and they don't go to the beach often, but they said, I'm going to take you to the beach. And I went to the beach on uh, Galveston Islands. Now, it's a big difference between Galveston Island and Sanibel and Captiva Islands. And I didn't know the difference until I went in the water and I came back out and I had tar between my toes and I had tar on my chest and I had tar all over my swim trunk from the offshore drilling and some of the other activities. So I think the management of resources and valuable resources such as our waterways, such as our artificial reefs, it's a critical part of what, what we provide. And Robert's got an excellent presentation that's going to give you, a, I think, a much better handle on what he does on a day-to-day -day basis and how important what he does is to our community, to our tourism <coughs> industry, and it's, a, it's he is a tremendous asset and a valuable asset. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert and let him speak to you gentlemen and ladies. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to uh, to our new member of the Tourist Development Council, Ms. Hoxing. And uh, it's good to be here again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Commissioner and Councilman, thank you very much. And women, thank you very much for this opportunity to um, to provide a, a, an overview of Marine Resources Division. Uh, and, and I've got on this title slide our mission. And, and our mission is to provide uh, healthy, safe, and productive waterways to our citizens and our visitors. And um, the, uh, the major programs of Marine Resources Division are artificial reefs, waterways access. These are our boat ramps and, and paddle craft launches, our fishing piers, fishing bridges, waterway management. These are things like the removal of derelict vessels, dredging our channels into uh, 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 Lafitte Cove so that our, our, our boats and, and visitors and, and residents can get up to the restaurants and marinas. Uh, having um, uh, derelict vessels in our waterways is a detriment to the environment and to our tourism. Uh, marine debris and, and things like that. These are the least favorite parts of my job, quite frankly, but they're so important because they, they retain our, our ability to enjoy those safe, productive, and healthy waterways. And then uh, special projects. These include things like our, our, um, our interns and volunteers. We, we do a lot in the school programs. We do a lot of, of fishing rodeos and uh, outside uh, events so that we promote what we're uh, what we're enjoying as, as stewards of our environmental resources, our marine resources. So these are just an overview of the types of, of programs that I administer through Marine Resources Division. But I want us to remember, because right now we're, we're one week away from the 11th anniversary of the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And a week later, when we realized that that oil spill was not being controlled, the blowout preventer was not stopping that flow of oil, we had a meeting at our emergency operations center between our, our Board of County Commissioners, our emergency managers, and I'll never forget a question the executive director of the Santa Rosa Island Authority asked, 
what am I going to tell the hotel in, on Pensacola Beach? What am I going to tell them to do? And the emergency manager for the Department of Environmental Protection, I'll never forget it, turned to him and said, I guess they're just going to have to shut down for the season. And that was a, a, a very powerful statement. And the Board of County Commissioners turned to the, our department and our division and asked us to put together a plan so that we could protect ourselves and we could get through that year and the subsequent years. So the, the amount of, of, uh, of, of value that we put on our, our marine resources and our environment are really very hard to, to maximize. It's, it, or how, it's hard to overstate those. So uh, the significant uh, accomplishments for the last year or two from the budget book, we've got three, three slides here. One is the, uh, the, the deployment of the Pensacola Bay Bridge. This is going to be at least one of the top three largest artificial reefs in the world. When we finish up, I've got another deployment this week. So um, we're, we've got uh, a, a diversity of artificial reefs and you'll see a little bit more about that. Derelict vessels, you can see the, the slide there is, is showing what, what our visitors come to the Visitors Information Center right now, and that's what they're looking at, is that sunken sailboat. That's one of seven derelict vessel cases that we're working right now. And uh, as soon as we get the authority from the law enforcement folks to, to remove that, we're going to have that removed. Uh, sea turtles, are th this is part of, of what we have to do to manage our beaches to allow us to develop and, and maximize our, our human use of the beaches. We have to protect the habitat and protect uh, uh, the uh, threatened and endangered species. Next slide. So Marine Resources Division, for 20 years, it was just me. I was the only, only employee in, in Marine Resources Division. Last year, uh, we put in a, a, an environmental programs manager. Uh, right now, we also have an intern coordinator. This is a part-time person that works about 10 hours a week. And this intern coordinator, she, she uh, manages about a dozen interns per semester, and then 31 sea turtle patrol volunteers and uh, beach ambassadors. And so we, when we look at the, the uh, full-time equivalents of that, that's between two and three FTEs that are our volunteers and our intern coordinator. Uh, we also, Marine Resources Division works a lot with our other county departments. We're a team here in Escambia County, so when the public works needs something done. Uh, they, they turn to me. I take them out on the boat to, in, to uh, inspect our bridges, to inspect our fishing piers. Our community and media res, uh, relations folks, they put together um, the press releases for the work that we're doing that gets us those media hits. Um, we also work with a lot of state and federal and local agencies. We work with a lot of NGOs. And, um, and, and volunteer groups here in Escambia County. And again, it's a team approach. When I'm providing you our, our, our accomplishments, they're not my accomplishments. They're the accomplishments of a lot of folks that, that we work with. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a slide that our, our community and media response uh, are, uh, put, put together. So I had my, my second COVID vaccination today. I'm getting a little bit of the dry mouth they warned me about. Our CMR folks put together press releases and then they measure those press releases and the number of hits that we get. And down on the bottom right of that slide, it shows you uh, what, those, what those numbers are. Um, you'll see in, in the, the middle picture there, the picture of the installation of our new snorkeling reef that we put in off of Pensacola Beach. This is within walking distance of over 500 hotel rooms right there on Casino Beach. Uh, the sea turtle picture that you see is also a, uh, uh, a huge media event. Thank you, sir. Good job. Excuse me. We had a huge uh, media event around a sea turtle that nested during the daytime on Pensacola Beach and got us a tremendous amount of press. The right-hand picture, the picture of the sea turtle underwater, this was a picture that I took at one of our snorkeling reefs off Pensacola Beach, and this has been widely shared. It's been on, uh, on the news. I've seen it in people's brochures for beach, uh, beach businesses, and um, it just shows another way that we, we 
market and, and provide our, our outreach to, uh, to potential customers, potential visitors. Next slide. Also in our social media, the uh, community and media relations folks and our department, they are the ones that, that actually manage these social media posts and put these, these photographs that we take when we're doing our work, they take that, those images and then they spread the message and you can see the, the number of, of returns on those, on those efforts. Next slide, please. And then if you really wanna spend some time, quality time on a rainy day, just Google artificial reefs off Pensacola or the Oriskany and you can spend literally hours watching videos on YouTube. Uh, the, the video that you see there, uh, the main image is, is a uh, underwater geocache that we put on the Oriskany, the first of its kind. The other video is, uh, is one that the community and media relations folks uh, put together uh, highlighting the reefing of the Three Mile Bridge. Next slide. Uh, also, we have our Escambia County website, and we, we, we promote our projects and allow the public to, uh, to understand what we're doing uh, through that mechanism, and you can see some of the measurements of those impacts. Next slide. But really, when, when, when people are, are looking at, at uh, the activities that they love, they're probably not going to myescambia.com. So I just went online and typed in uh, snorkeling Pensacola Beach, and this slide came up. And if you look there, all those, dive, all those dive flags are snorkeling reefs off the Panhandle Coast. And the very first one was the one that we built off of Park East. And all the other counties are now, they're actually outpacing us and building artificial reefs similar to ours to the east of us. And then, next slide. So I looked at their, at their homepage and look at the, the highlighted uh, metric, right, metric right there. The top 10 snorkeling reefs regions in the world in Escambia County, Pensacola is, or the, the Panhandle of Florida is number two. So the, the word's getting out and the word is out there. The, 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 a lot of this marketing is being done uh, by other entities, by user groups. Next slide. So as a, I'm a scientist, I'm a marine biologist, and I look to the science a lot of times when I'm trying to verify what I'm seeing. And I see a lot of stuff on, on economic returns, but I go to the peer-reviewed scientific literature, and I found this very interesting article that linked the economic benefits of a, a quality environment back into those tourist values, to those tourism dollars and those tur tourism returns on investment. Next slide. This was a study that was done by uh, Dr. Huth, an, an economist at UWF back in 2015. He measured the economic impacts of fishing and diving on artificial reefs throughout the state of Florida. He es estimated these by county and the, uh, the, the economic return per year is $150 million and that's fishing and diving on artificial reefs attributed to Escambia County. Next slide. And these also support over 2,200 jobs. Next slide. So here's just kind of a, a, a summary slide of a lot of the projects that we do from our artificial reefs to removing derelict vessels. And that's me down in the bottom left. Uh, sometimes we, we take the, the low cost approach and we, we remove these vessels ourselves. Um, and that's a way to, uh, to, to again, do, do a lot of this work in house. Uh, we do dredging and the, the dredge materials go on Pensacola Beach uh, so that our visitors have uh, a nice beach to be able to enjoy. And uh, of course the, the, the oil spill boom, you can see that as well. And then we do some uh, living shorelines to try to provide shoreline protection as well as improve water quality habitat. Next slide. Uh, this is a, uh, a couple of interviews that we did with local businesses. Hi, my name is Michael Corin. I own and operate All Jacked Up Charters. I started All Jacked Up Charters in Perdido Key in 2010 to present. When we started, we only had three boats running. Now today, there's probably around 20 boats out of Perdido Key running. I average 240 trips a year with four people on each trip. We run inshore and offshore trips. I bring 960 customers per year to Perdido Key to experience what we love to do. Thanks to the I-10 bridge rubble, and thanks to the other pyramids that have been put out in state waters, 
we're catching a wide variety and abundance of fish on every trip. Hello, my name's Kerry Freeland and I'm the president of Dive Pros. We're a Florida corporation that has operated in Escambia County since 1988. Our business model has always been heavily reliant on the assets that uh, the county has provided us with the artificial reef program dating back to the mid 80s. In the past 20 years, I've watched the county's artificial reef program basically put us on the map. When we got the Ariscany, it was the crown jewel in a myriad of wrecks that we already had, but we saw people come from all over the world to dive the Ariscany. And they consequently got to see the other sites that we have and spend the money in the, in the community as well. In addition to the artificial reefs offshore, the snorkeling reefs have really brought a whole nother facet to tourism to our area. Now when people come down and they say, hey, I want to go snorkeling, where can I go? I've got numerous places to send them thanks to the county. Hi, my name is Mike. So Michael is standing at the mahogany mill boat ramp. This was a boat ramp that we built, that Escambia County built with funds that we obtained from the natural resources damage assessment with on property that the county purchased through local option sales tax. So we're, we're taking resources and then we're leveraging those resources, getting ourselves shovel ready so that when opportunities come for outside funding, we're able to take advantage of those and we've doubled the size, the, the infrastructure of our saltwater uh, boat ramp since I've been here. We're getting ready to build another one on, Pit, or on Perdido Bay that will be the first boat ramp on the Scambia County side of Perdido Bay that'll have not only access to, to uh, boats that need a, a trailer and a motor, but also for paddle craft. We're working with the, uh, the state of Alabama to create a snorkeling trail uh, down the Perdido River out into to Perdido Bay. You've got a couple of little uh, freebies that we've, we've provided you. One of these is the Escambia and Santa Rosa County's Boating and Angling Guide. Uh, this is a guide that helps our visitors who may not be familiar with our waterways, shows them where our boating access points are, where our fishing access points are, and the, 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 the economic values of, of these resources. Again, it's very hard to, to overstate those values, but um, the, 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 the amount of, of return on investment that we're providing is, is substantial and we are very happy to be able to do this. We're very proud of our accomplishments and we look forward to continuing those. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Uh, does anybody have any comments or questions? Tish? Where do you keep these at if, if, a, cust or if a, a visitor wanted one of these? Uh, we have these at this building. We have them all around uh, Pensacola Beach, the, the tackle shops and the diving shops. We've got uh, plenty of these. If, you, if you'd like to have some, we'd be happy to, to give you some. I brought them out to the Pensacola Beach Visitor Center. Okay. As well, so we're, right. we're uh, I, and I hope that they're at the Visitors Information Center in Pensacola. But if not, we'll replenish their supply as well. All right, Robert. Let me ask a quick question, Jim. Sorry about that. That's right. So, did you did you make this, or is this somebody else made this? No, uh, I, mean, I worked office? with I worked with the uh, the folks that are in. In fact, in here you'll see a, uh, a contributors list. Okay. So you can actually see in here who worked on that. But I will take credit for the fact that we actually used the the 42012 the uh the uh, uh navigation chart for the entire escambia county the old one had panels and it was for a visitor it was very difficult for them to be able to navigate from pensacola bay to perdido bay or old river because it wasn't in one uh, one map this one of the contributions that i made was making it more user friendly and more understandable Good. to people that don't live here by having our waterways on a single map that, yes, mi that mimics that, uh, that navigation map. I would think that this should be in every industry partner in Escambia County, right? Uh, because if you wanna showcase the work of your office and the things that you and your team does, this needs to go to residents that are not here in Escambia County that stay at partner like at Tisha's, like at Innisfree. These need to be readily accessible to all of our partners in Escambia County. I appreciate your uh, presentation, it was nice. Thank you, Robert. Yes, and, and I will mention as well that these are, are available digitally so people can access these online. Yes, sir. Oh, great, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments?
Great. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate you it. You bet. And, and as, a, as a teaser for you, I'll, I'll leave you with a, an upcoming uh, a rollout of the Pensacola Beach Eco Trail. That's a, a new updated version has been uh, developed and, and, and I was part of the backup to that. I was providing the, the marine biology and some of the images for that. But look for that because it's a fantastic way for our visitors to become engaged and, and understand and, and interact with our resources in a way that's sustainable. Thank that's you very much. And Robert, if you would uh, provide Zanani a copy of that presentation so she could send it out to each of us, yeah. it would be great. Yes. So we can look through it. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for the water. <laughs> that really yeah, sure. helped. Thank uh, you. Just real, on that, that derelict vessel, we, that is something we've been working on since January. We, um, I know I made contact with, with you in January. Grover, Mayor Robinson reached out to us a week or so ago trying to, trying to get it. Um, the, the hope was that we could get to it before it ended up in its current state. Um, but of course, there are uh, limitations on, on what we can do to those, those vessels, and, and there's a process that it, it takes. Um, I, I, you know, other than the, the environmental damage, just the, the eyesore that it, that you, that's what you see when you come down 17th and pop under the, the railroad trestle is this sailboat on its side. Um, and, uh, and, and so again, we were trying to get to it. As soon as I could see that it was in trouble, um, we, we tried to address it, but just uh, didn't, didn't make it in time. Yes, sir. And the, there's a law enforcement because we're taking someone's property. There is a law enforcement process that has to be done, and that's external to Marine Resources Division. So when they finish up and they authorize us, then we we take care of it, and we will get to that. At our I say, Darren, you probably saw it outside your office, and as it would slowly the the sail came out, and then it the mast broke, and then it. We asked if we could sell the ship, but we were told we couldn't. <laughs> it could have been the it, you guys could have started doing tours. I mean. Hey, what a great segue. Uh, yeah. you know, great segue into our <laughs> next item. This is Pensacola. Darren? Yes, ma'am. Oh, digitally would be great. Yeah. Thank you. We can quit killing trees. Cindy, you want to? Cindy, did you need a copy of this? <laughs> Good afternoon, council members. My name is Darren Schaefer. I'm president and CEO for Visit Pensacola. And uh, I'm very excited that one week from today will be one year for me here in Pensacola. <laughs> and it has been an amazing 12 months. Um, <laughs> and a uh, lot, uh, lot of new things that we've experienced over that time and what we've been through as a destination, what we're continuing to be going through, and I'm very proud of the team at Visit Pensacola and all of our partners and stakeholders like the TDC of coming and working together to get through 2020. Um, I'm very excited about what's gonna happen in the next 12 months, and there's a lot, of, a lot of really positive indicators, even in our current situation, that uh, I'm very optimistic about where things are gonna be going. So I'm gonna share a few of those things I'm excited about. One of those is that uh, in February, Visit Pensacola applied for and received a payroll protection loan, forgivable loan, and so we were able to uh, do some internal promotions and bring back some staff positions now rather than waiting six months from now. So uh, basically in marketing and sales, one of our internal promotions is here today, Wandy. If you could stand up, this is Wandy Samuel, who is our accounting manager. Um, for those of you who know Kimberly Sparks, uh, she resigned back in February to take an opportunity with Covenant House. And so Wandy's been with us for five years, uh, basically training with Kimberly over that time. So he has stepped up into that role and will be uh, involved uh, basically in the same way as she was with, with uh, making sure the financials are, are tr transparent and provided in a, a timely manner. We also took our partner relations manager, Kaya Mann, promoted her into the destination sales manager. So we're, we're bringing back the sales efforts. We're seeing more interest in leads and bookings coming in. She's doing a great job. We'll rehire a partner relations manager. 
and also Lindsay Steck in our office, who is a marketing and communications associate stepping up into a manager position because we're expanding what we're doing on the social media side. We've seen a lot of success there, but it takes a number of hours to make sure you stay on top of all the social media opportunities and make sure we're responding in a timely manner and, and staying on top of all the trends and, and sentiment that's being shared through, through social media. So with that, right now we have three positions that are open um, on our website. One is a social media and content associate. We're bringing back a design person, digital and creative, and then that partner relations manager. So about this time last year, I had to go through that difficult process of uh, looking at our staffing and reducing staffing. Um, I personally had to reduce five staff positions. We also had two staff positions that were open that we didn't fill. So. Um, what I'm seeing with what's happening with TDT collections, how the industry and our business environment's coming back, um, I think I would still have had to wait if we wouldn't have had the opportunity to take advantage of this payroll protection plan forgivable loan. TDT collections, I like to talk about that because there's some, some good news, positive news there. Um, I know you've been shared with that report if you take a look at it, TDT collections through the first six months of this fiscal year are up 9.7% over last year, and that's all pre-COVID. And last year was up over the previous year, so when we look at fiscal year 2019, our last full year, we're up 11.1% 11 11 through the first six months of this fiscal year. Uh, there's a lot of contributing factors uh, that make that happen, and I'm happy to go through those with you um, if you'd like to hear those. But basically, our budget right now is based on $10 million, which has really taken us back to 2016. That's the last time that we had TDT collections that have been at about $10 million. And right now, based on that year, collections currently, through the first six months, are up $1.2 million. So if all things are equal and we don't have any additional increases compared to 2016, we're really operating more at $11.2 million. Uh, that's what we should be expecting in collections for this year. However, I think we're going to be exceeding that because our trends, what we're seeing in projections and numbers for March through May are all exceeding what happened in 2019. So we think those numbers will continue to grow. Um, we, we can track some of that through a vendor we have called Key Data. Key Data tracks what happens uh, in bookings through the uh, vacation rentals, condos, short-term rentals, and um, you know, barring a major setback, like I said, the bookings right now, is, as of this time this year compared this time the last two years, we're up 58% over fiscal year 19. So those are all really strong trends. A lot of that has to do with pent-up demand. Um, it has to do with some of the marketing that we've done. It also has to do with some of the work that's being done. We still have some holdover from uh, Hurricane Sally remediation. Obviously, we have additional crews here working on the bridge, but our other pieces of business are coming back slower, but they're coming back. Positive indicators like the airport with new airlines and additional routes being added are all contributing to that. So looking forward to next year, fiscal year, 2022, I'm excited that we're talking about fiscal year 2022 budget already. That process has started and I've sat down with Administrator Gilly and Amber McClear to talk about what that budget amount should be for next year. I don't think it should be $10 million. Um, I think 11.2, 11.3 is where we're already at with six months to go. And I think we're on a, a positive trend. I really think we're looking at 2019 when we hit about $12.3 million and that's my initial suggestion to the county, and we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna track the next few months and see how that goes. But my goal is by uh, our June meeting that, uh, that we'll have a, a plan, a budget plan proposal for TDC, which is before the July workshops begin. Also know that we'll have the fifth cent, which obviously has started now, the first 12 months. Uh, I've been dedicated to unified budget, so we have six months in this fiscal year, six months in next fiscal year, and so next year, as of April, um, those dollars right now have not, to be, have not been determined how those will be spent. Um, I do believe that based on what we went through this year and some of the conversations that have been had, that there is value in creating reserve funds that have very specific uses that cannot be tampered with, because I share the concern that Tish had expressed that sometimes reserves can be 
reallocated uh, with by different, uh, you know, a few years from now, we have different people uh, on the, um, as commissioners that uh, think uh, focuses change. So having a reserve for marketing, for an emergency situation like this that we build up starting now going forward and get it to a certain up dollar amount would put us in a much better position the next time we run into um, a climatic situation like we've been experiencing. I think there's also been interest in using fifth uh, cent funds towards a new facility or a venue development, multi-purpose sports facility or a conference center. And I think there's, there's ways to set aside dollars for, for that as well. Um, as well as there's been um, interest in setting aside some dollars for beach renourishment. So I've had some thoughts on that. I'm interested in talking with the, uh, the commissioners as well as members of the council and share some of those perspectives with you and get your feedback as, as we go forward. Um, but I think since we've, we've done the hard part of trimming back now as our budget's coming back and TDT is growing, let's come back and do it a, a smart way and plan for the future. Um, coming up, um, first week of May, we always uh, celebrate National Travel and Tourism Week. That's the first full week in May. We're promoting the power of travel, so we always have a series of events. Monday we start off with uh, coffee with the president, so that's going to be a sellout situation. I want everybody to plan for that. It's a virtual coffee with the president. Tuesday, we're going to continue to support a program that we rolled out about this time last year, which was Help Out, Dine Out, so encouraging uh, people to, to uh, support our local restaurants. And this is encouraging uh, organizations and businesses to take their team out to lunch and support the restaurants. Wednesday, we are bringing back the Tourism Luncheon and celebrating our Hospitality Hero Awards, and we're going to be doing that at the beautiful new Bayview Community Center. Thursday, we'll be doing a virtual tourism summit. We're going to bring in uh, Visit Florida to do a presentation, kind of a state of the state, and then work with our own research agency down in St. Germain's to bring that perspective to our local Pensacola area. And it wouldn't be hospitality if we didn't encourage uh, an adult beverage from now and then. So Thursday, Thursdays, we'll also be uh, encouraged to go out and support our, uh, our local bars, and we'll probably be doing a, uh, a, a meetup, designated meetup um, as well. Friday, we wanted to do a community outreach program, which would be a beach cleanup. Um, we want to support uh, our friends out at Pensacola Beach, and so every year we'll move that around. And then Friday and Saturday, we'll be doing an open houses at the visitor information centers, all in support of the power of travel and our local tourism industry. There's more information on that. It'll be at visitpensacola.org, not .com. We have the two sites. And then uh, finally, for our next TDC meeting in June, we would like to bring out Downs in St. Germain and, and do a presentation on that unique emotional positioning study that we did. I know we talked about it briefly, but we'd really like for them to share the results of that study, as well as the follow-up study we're doing called the PRISM study. So those are two important pieces that help direct our marketing efforts and make sure that we're really on target with what we're doing. And finally, next I'd like to um, talk about the Sunbelt Basketball Conference and uh, uh, welcome Ray Palmer from Pensacola Sports to come up as well. <laughs> I promised I will be extremely quick. I don't need to be up here. Darren's going to do a great job. He's put, they've put together a wonderful presentation uh, with all the details that uh, the county asked us to do to present to the Tourist Development Council. I'm here strictly to thank you all for supporting it. Thank Visit Pensacola, the Sunbelt Conference, um, the, the Bay Center, DIB, Pensacola State College, um, whom I'm missing and our partners showcase everybody for the support. It was a great event. The Bay Center and Pensacola State College looked phenomenal phenomenal on national TV all day, uh, each day. Uh, the event's going to be expanded next year, um, so we're excited about that. So I'm going to flip it back to Darren. Um, we were thrilled to be a part of it, and we don't think see anything but way, way, way great stuff to happen. We had almost four, we had 4,000 plus room nights on a year that I will say we did not have cheerleaders and we did not have bands, which are, will be required to be here, which will, um, we'll double our number before we ever get to a fan. So thank you all again for everything that you did. All the level city of Pensacola, I'm sorry, that's who I forgot, was a major contributor as well. So thank you all. I'm going to flip it back to Darren. 
All right, thank you, Ray. Uh, yeah, it was really a team effort. I came in after the, after the fact, but uh, really enjoyed working with everybody to uh, create an opportunity that uh, they feel welcome in our community and treat them in a way they hadn't been treated before, especially in New Orleans. And I think we, we certainly accomplished that, and it's a great first year of the event. Um, we're gonna show you a little sizzle reel that we put together that talks about and shows you some of the video and images from, from the event. And then Leslie Perino from Showcase is going to just walk you through the scope of the marketing that we did. We learned a lot in our first year and uh, I know that uh, with a additional focus on ticket sales and with all the additional groups coming in that we'll see these numbers grow significantly next year. So if I do this, will it work? My name is Leslie Perino. I'm part of the Showcase Pensacola team, and I will quickly just share an overview of the marketing, uh, short people problems, sorry, um, <laughs> of the marketing program that we did for the Sunbelt Conference. So our objective for this campaign was first to drive awareness, interest, and of course, finally ticket sales for this, for this event here. Um, our campaign started early in January and went all the way through the conference, which was March 5th through 8th, and we spent a budget of a little over $111,000. Uh, we had two different targets. We had our local and regional target, which was 60 miles from Pensacola. And then we chose out of market targets that were the schools that were most likely to travel here. So that was University of South Alabama, Troy, University of Arkansas, Arkansas State, Georgia State, Georgia Southern, University of Louisiana Lafayette, and also University of Louisiana Monroe. So all out of market target, all out of market advertising was targeted to those specific schools. The tactics that we used were digital display advertising, social media, outdoor television, radio, print, promotions, and public relations. The key performance indicators that we wanted to look at for this campaign were landing page views, and we got over 33,000 landing page views, almost 34,000. Um, the time spent on the site was 59 seconds. We drove 1,614 clicks to Ticketmaster and 448 to the Sunbelt Conference web pages. Our social media engagement had over 122,000 engagements, and we had ticket sales of over 4,365. We know that there were over 5,000 ticketed attendees there, and that excludes the teams. Um, two of the things that we use to help measure our results are Adara and Arrivalist. And Adara looks at connecting digital ad views with hotel views and flight searches. So from this advertising, we can see that 971 people who saw digital ads searched for flights, 1,368 searched for hotels, we saw 75 flight bookings, uh, 448 clicks to Sunbelt web pages, and 52 confirmed room nights. Arrivalist is a little bit different, and that tracks people that saw an ad on a device, and then that device shows up here in our market. So that is measured in exposure, so we had over 4.6 million exposures, and we could track 52 arrivals from that. Now, that is just a sampling. It's not a full picture of who actually came here because we can't track every single device that comes into the market. It just kind of gives us an idea. So I won't go through all the details of, of what's on here, but I'll just flip through so you can see samples of the digital display advertising. We use native targeting, connected TV, digital display, pay-per-click, just about every digital tactic that you can think of. Um, 
in market and out of market. We also did social media marketing. We had over a million impressions, over 500,000 reach. Um, really good res response from that. We also did organic social media. Um, over 52 messages were sent. That had over 130,000 impressions and over 3,000 engagements, and that itself drove 377 link clicks. So you're seeing really solid metrics on this. We also did outdoor advertising, again, in those specific school markets, and we showcased the athletes from those schools. So it would be particularly eye-catching. So if it was a billboard in Troy, we showed Troy athletes, and uh, we thought that was a nice tactic to really capture attention and get that interest ahead of time. And then when it got closer, we did in-market advertising in Pensacola and Fort Walton Beach, and we had four digital billboards rotating through different locations in those areas. Television, we did a little bit of out of, out of market um, in Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, and Louisiana. And then also we had our in-market coverage with Channel 3, KRG, and Cox. And we had some in-kind media sponsorships which helped boost our coverage for that budget. We also did quite a lot of radio advertising. That was all an in-market effort, and we had great support from our local stations. Uh, we, you can see we ran with quite a few of them, and we had in-kind media sponsorships totaling 13,500 there, so that was a really big boost. Print advertising, we also did ads in the News Journal and in N Weekly. There, too, we also got in-kind sponsorships of 2,500 that helped add to our exposure. And then promotions included street banners, the sidewalk stickers along Palafox Street. I hope you guys saw those. Those were pretty cool. I was not responsible for that, but I think they were super cool. Um, the Fan Fest promotion, host bar coordinations. There were host bars for each school, and we encouraged the participants when they were between games to go to the bars and enjoy um, hanging out with their friends. And then there was also a free trolley service Saturday and Sunday that helped get people from the Civic Center around downtown to the businesses. Public relations, of course, there were press releases, we had a press conference, media pitches, did quite a few interviews with print, radio, and television, and several media assists helping people get information about the, the event. Um, more than four million impressions were achieved there and a media coverage value of over $58,000. This is a, a breakdown of the budget that was spent. So you can see what we spent out of market, what we spent in market on each tactic, the in-kind sponsorships that we got. Um, we had a budget of $120,000 that we allocated. We ended up spending 111, just a little over 111,000, but yet the total value we got was 130,693. So that is it. Do you have any questions for me on Sunbelt? Any questions, anyone? Robert? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I think I talked about it with, with Darren maybe or, or something, but um, I, don't, I don't know exactly with FanFest, yeah, I don't know if we were able to look in this, but um, I thought about how cool it would be if we could actually take Fan FanFest to the beach um, and, and get it out there, but um, I know there may be some logistical issues that, that go along with it, but um, also just trying to show off uh, some of our other assets through this promotion and, and getting people to experience other things. Um, outside the arena, so um, I, I know we we'll, might be working on that for next year. Do you guys want to speak to that or not? We'll work on that. Yes, sir. I don't believe we have it scheduled to five. It starts at three. So we're gonna bring up, uh, we just wanna talk briefly about the other big initiative that uh, the Tourism Development Council was very, uh, a big part of helping us acquire this, which was the funds for, from the CARES Act. Um, in support of that, helped us get $500,000 to uh, initiate a uh, marketing campaign that ran November and December primarily. And I'm gonna have, uh, Dickie Appleyard come up and, and, and talk about that. We work with Showcase to implement that. So I'm have them do that. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna say one thing. I mentioned the budget goal for next year. That is my proposed number. I think both Janice and uh, Amber would be more conservative. And so my job is to convey and convince that my <laughs> number is a true and good number for next year. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Darren. 
Okay, I'll be pretty quick about this, but we wanted to show this because you've been involved in the middle of it. Uh, this is about the CARES Act money that we got, and what I want you to understand as I start, we spent all the money that you all got for us in the CARES Act, which was a half million dollars, was spent entirely on television, something we're not able to spend, generally speaking, out of our budget because it's not big enough to go into, the, into some of the cities. So we start on November the 10th. We continued it through uh, February the 28th. We used other media while the television was running from the budget. So you'll see some about the TV, which is all what you provided through CARES Act. And then beyond that, the digital side is what we do regularly for uh, Visit Pensacola. So the total budget was 778,345. 500,000 of it was came from the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act funding was for TV. We ran 404,251 spots. You can see where the budget breakdown, and I can tell you that some of the markets uh, that you see there are pretty expensive. Atlanta, Houston, and Dallas, all are key markets for uh, Pensacola, very key. But generally speaking, we don't have enough money to advertise in those areas, although now we're working on some um, new tactics that might include TV, but a different kind of TV. Found an awful lot of spots ran in those uh, areas in that couple of months. Average arrivals in those markets was excellent uh, for the most part. You can see we did pretty well despite the fact that we were having our issues in our community plus, et cetera, a uh, 2.3% uh, uh, increase in arrivals uh, during that time was great. If you ask me why was Tallahassee down, I can't answer that question. I asked the same question myself, but it, some some dynamics cause that to happen. We'll look into it. There you see the CARES Act funding impact uh, for November and December. And you can remember there was a second wave at January. In general, we had the holidays and everybody was having a good time. Travel was pretty good, boom, uh, January hit. And you can see where it dipped down. Uh, but the good news is people stayed longer and, um, and they increased their average time in the market by 15%. So those people who were willing to travel stayed a longer time uh, here in our market. Um, now the trackable results, that comes from the digital. You know, on TV, all we can tell you is how many people we reached, but we can't tell you if they came to town. And so the digital part, which came from the uh, Visit Pensacola budget, uh, the trackable revenue was three, over $3 million. Trackable nights, almost 10,000. Uh, trackable flights, almost 1,500. Uh, the return on ad spend was 4.2. What you see on the right-hand side there is an example of the digital advertising that we were running. The website traffic was up 15.9 of all site, uh, site users. We had a landing page about the coastal distancing uh, campaign that we ran. Uh, and amazingly, during that period of time, a lot of people were shopping, which gives us a lot more optimism on the future. There are a lot of people looking to travel now, and as people, more and more people get immunized, that will benefit us. I ran through it pretty quickly, but again, I pretty regularly come to your group and say thank you. The things you did to help us with the budget were a godsend. As you mentioned before, we still have recovery to do, recovery from the uh, bridge, et cetera, but the role y'all played at the end of last year was incredible and really helped us to drive business. Thank you. Thank you, Dickie. That's the end of our presentation, unless there's questions. Any questions or comments for Visit Pensacola? Yeah. Great, thank you so much, we appreciate it. Uh, updates, I don't know if Ray, you have anything else from Pensacola Sports? I do, but it, I know it's a long day, so you tell me if you want it or not. Is it fast? Is it important? Is it good? Does it require a vote? Yeah. Well, I do. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, of course, it's important. Yeah. It's important in my world, and it's probably important in the hotelier's world. So, I'll, I'll be fairly quickly. Uh, quick. We do have a, we're lucky. We got a lot going on. Um, the, um, we have just uh, helped a local group secure a first ever uh, the Southern National Doubles Disc Golf Championships to be held in May. We were a competitive set against another community, and we were uh, we were lucky enough to help them uh, get that awarded. We're excited. Disc golf is a hot is a hot sport, so we're excited about that. Um, we held the double bridge run. Uh, 
considering all the um, uh, challenges, it was a great night. 500 room nights on the beach. Uh, had a lot of people come in from out of town, so the numbers look really good on that. Um, we have not gotten the well. We've gotten the official notification. We've not signed the contract yet, but we've been notified by the National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics (NAIA), if you will, to host their national men's lacrosse championships in 2022 and 2023. We're excited about that. We'll be going over to Savannah, who's hosting it this year in a few weeks, and we'll learn about that because we honestly don't know a lot about lacrosse, but. Sports to sport, right? We got people that can figure out how to do that. So we're excited about that two year commitment. Um, we had a dozen teams come in for our junior college uh, tennis event at Roger Scott uh, Tennis facility uh, first week in March, or second week in March, I'm sorry. Um, it's an uh, event we created. Uh, so they bring uh, JUCO uh, of the five, six men and five women, actually it was 11 teams, um, that showed up. They were all in the top um, of the top ten of the country in tennis, so it's phenomenal tennis. They come in, we we uh, provide them a tennis court, and they come in and buy hotel rooms. So it's really a fun event we created a few years ago, and continues to be successful. We've met with AJGA to look at a junior golf event, uh, so we're getting the details with that. Um, we're working with the Florida Sports Foundation. I mentioned it quickly last meeting about an international beach games. We're gonna push that to 2022, just too much happening, quite frankly, uh, in the short time that they wanted to do that. Um, in two, in uh, the 23rd and 24th, whatever that is, a week and a half, we will hold two events on Pensacola Beach, the DeLuna Swim, which we have partnered with a, a group called Salty Sports Society, and we are now part of a Speedo series, state series. This is an event, this will be the third year of our open water swim. We're the only open water swim left in the market. And um, we are well over 200 attendees, which is double what we've ever had before. And we are still growing. So we're real, real excited of being a part of this Speedo series and the growth that this looks like uh, for that event. While we do that, the same time we do the firefighter challenge, again, I'll tell you, it's the coolest thing we ever do. If you don't mind riding that to the beach, it's worth it to get out there and watch those firefighters and to watch what they do. Um, and that's uh, Saturday and Sunday, or Friday, Saturday, 23rd and 24th of April. We have our USDA Futures Tennis event happening in May. Um, I traveled to a new state organization uh, of sports tourism industry um, leaders uh, in Gainesville a couple of weeks ago, first time. Great, uh, uh, great experience. Um, we're working on a, uh, a new um, program that will allow us to um, market all of the assets in Scambia County and what our venues are, what the descriptions are, and tie them with all the national organ governing bodies and organizations so they can look at Pensacola and go, yes, you have the number of fields, the right kind of fields, the right kind of facilities that we have, and it will, uh, it will really be a nice marketing tool for us. And um, lastly is we have a meeting tomorrow and we're working on some hotel uh, industry um, a product of help us to book, booking and accounting to you all and the county on the room night capture is a challenge always has been uh, and so we've got a, uh, an organization that we're going to meet with tomorrow and we hope to be moving forward with that that will help us better identify what did we spend how do we did how do we capture those folks any questions sorry I could keep going but I'll shut up thank you Ray thank you any questions or comments Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have a presentation from ACE uh, today, but they are working on Fufu Fest. Uh, it's very early stages, but we'll have, uh, I'll ask them to give a presentation at the next meeting in June. Uh, anyone here from Naval Aviation Museum? Yes. Oh, please, thank you. All right, thanks to the last short speaker. Uh, I uh, <laughs> don't have to adjust this whole lot. Uh, for those of you ha who haven't met me, I'm Kyle Kozed. Uh, since the 1st of October, uh, I took over as the uh, uh, CEO and the president of the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. So really just a couple updates for you on uh, initiatives that we have to overcome some of the hardships 
uh, that we've seen in the past 18 months. And I, I'd like to you know, start off any discussion with an illustration uh, of the impact of the shooting uh, that we've had, which you know, resulted in canceling, you know, Big Navy canceling the public access uh, uh, waiver that uh, has been resident for many, many, many years. Um, in 2019, prior to the shooting, uh, we uh, enjoyed 724,000 visitors to the museum, 724,000. The year following, uh, so once that waiver was rescinded and the only people that could access the base and in turn access the museum and our flight academy, uh, that number plummeted from 724,000 to 50,000. So, you know, for us, uh, visitation is revenue. Revenue keeps us moving and going. Uh, and so we're looking beyond these hardships. Uh, the pandemic also had a pretty significant uh, impact. Uh, the museum was closed for just over seven months uh, last year due to due the impact of the pandemic, uh, as well as our National Flight Academy, which brings in you know, lots of visitors from around not only the country but the world during the summer months. Uh, and we were forced to make a hard decision again based on public health and meeting sizes uh, and gathering. So uh, we will not be able to do a, a program this summer as well. So again, for the National Flight Academy, you know, those campers come in and provide revenue to keep the building operating. Um, we've, uh, we've actually gone from, since I've been here, uh, 156 employees. Uh, we've furloughed uh, down to 38 employees. So pretty significant impacts. Um, but I tell you that because I'm a glass half full guy. Uh, and you know, the long-term vision here uh, is to move beyond our reliance in the Navy to tell us who can and who can't access the museum uh, via the base. Uh, and so uh, we're working a public and private partnership with Senator Broxson and uh, you know, some local, some state, some, uh, uh, some national agencies to be able to come up with $17 million of capital project uh, that really creates an expressway from the front gate at NES Pensacola um, off of uh, Navy Boulevard that will take folks directly uh, to Barrancas National Cemetery uh, and uh, to the museum. Uh, it allows that direct access that is unfettered by Navy policy. And really what that, that expressway does uh, is, you know, it limits where people can go. So it provides protection, safety, and security uh, to the 60,000 students, you know, who come to NAS Pensacola every year, but also the families who live on board. That's a longer term initiative. Um, our goal is, you know, to reach the uh, desired amount of money so that we can start the capital project, you know, by the end of this year. But again, it's not an overnight project. Um, so the near term uh, is uh, to partnership, partner with the base. And I've talked with uh, Skipper Kinsella uh, at length over the last couple weeks with a concept you know, that would really, you know, bring us a reservation system. So I had an opportunity to work at the White House for two years. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to come to Washington, D.C., visit the White House, you put in a reservation request. It vetted uh, you through a security system to make sure you didn't have any outstanding warrants. Uh, and I got to thinking to myself, if it was good enough for the White House, why can't we apply kind of the same mechanism uh, to the base here? Uh, and so uh, waiting on final approval from uh, the installation itself, but you know, with any luck, the next time we update you, you know, I can tell you about you know how we're applying money towards uh, advertising, kind of re-kicking our uh, our advertising campaign, so we can let people know that this is how you visit your National Naval Aviation Museum. And uh, you know, the way it worked was, you know, Joe would be in town from uh, Tennessee on vacation. Uh, he and his family would put in a reservation request. Um, I'm actually going to fund contractors who would manage the system. They would do the work. Uh, they would uh, do the research, uh, do the security of vetting. Then they would turn that around and say, you've been approved, send you an email uh, with your confirmation number. And then every day at uh, 830, you know, we would provide that cleared confirmation list to the front gate and the back gate. Uh, the front gate, just in case, access would still likely be to the back gate. But, you know, I'm confident that you know, if we can get approval for that system, then we can, you know, rise from 50,000 visitors last year, you know, to a point next year where, you know, we're back up in the 500,000, 600,000. Uh, and it's a, you know, temporary initiative that overcomes the lack of base access for our public today uh, until we have this expressway in place uh, here in a few years. So I'll be brief there, uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, but uh, with hardship comes opportunity, and that's the way we're approaching this right now. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate the update. Yes, sir. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? I, Commissioner? I, uh, Admiral Coast, good seeing you again. Yes, sir. Good seeing you. Uh, and uh, 
uh, had a chance to, to, to be with um, uh, Sterling the other day, and, and I, I think one of the questions I had for him is, is why can locals or citizens get a, a pass to get to the golf course, um, but we can't get it to the museum? Because uh, as a local, I would love to get, get, you know, take the kids out to the museum or something like that, or, or uh, as the Blue Angels are doing practices during the week, get out to see them. Um, is, is, there, is there a real reason why on, on why we can get one but not the other? So, so I, I think the, and, and this is COZED speculation, but I think the real uh, reason is capacity. So there are, you know, a handful of golfers that come on, a lot of retired golfers right. uh, that have access, and the numbers are small enough that the base has the resources to be able to do, you know, that security screening to give you a pass for a day, for a week, for, for a month. Um, what I'm suggesting is, you know, a similar system uh, through a reservation system that I provide, you know, contractors to be able to do this at a larger scale. Uh, and, and, and if I may, I think that's a great idea um, to, to, to shoot up the chain of command on, 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 on ways to, to do that. Um, I think that's, that's a great initiative. Um, it, it seems like it's simplified. Um, and, and so I appreciate you, you trying to find a way, I guess, uh, just frustration on, on my part and, and probably those of, of citizens uh, that if I wanted to, I could go get a, I think it's like a six month pass even, uh, that I could go get that right now, but it still wouldn't get me access to the, to the museum. So I, I feel for you all. I know that it's outside of your control. Um, I, so. I, I don't want to. I don't want to say that my frustration is greater than yours, but I know that it's equal. And you know, I, I get. I, I would say it's probably greater because you're having to deal with it on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, but it's. Uh, but yes. So. So I guess the lesson there is learn how to play golf. <laughs> it, it's, it's trying to find time to play golf is the problem. <laughs> All right. Well, any other questions? Well, I would just like to say I applaud you guys on uh, researching this type of system because I think other than simplifying or, or maybe streamlining your uh, admissions to the to the museum it also gives you the opportunity to specifically collect the data of your visitor mm -hmm. uh, that that you can then use to target your marketing or research where the visitors are coming from and, and reallocate you know some of your advertising dollars to because if they're coming from one certain area and you're spending all your money there maybe mm -hmm. you reduce it move it whatever I mean but just you're, you're going to be able to collect so much information that people are going to have to give you if they want to come. Absolutely. Instead of, instead of doing visitor inter, you know, interface surveys and stopping them while they're there to collect it, you get it all at the beginning. So and was, that a, was that a funding request for the, for the I, I was just curious, is, was that what you were asking for? What, what's well, that? hold on, Adam, don't say that. Please, sir. Uh, what I'm saying is, is you have you have a partner here. Uh, the, the Naval Air Museum is one of the greatest resources in Escambia County, and it's certainly more important to the west side of Pensacola than anything over there, really, other than the beaches, of course. Equal value, in fact. Uh, know that you have a, a partner here, and at any time uh, we can help you in any way. Let us know how. Uh, it is a very important part of Escambia County. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Are you sure you want me to answer that? I can answer that question now. Right you now. can. Now you can. Now you're ready to answer that. Uh, if, if, I'm sure if the TDC wants to give the hundred thousand to the to the museum out of out of the their funds as opposed to the BOCC's uh, four cent, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, oblige. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I was seeing, you know. It's already been budgeted for this yeah. year, so oh, we'll discuss next it this summer before the <laughs> workshops. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Right, thank you so much. We All right, on behalf work. of the foundation of the museum, we appreciate your yes. continued support here. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you do. Anyone from UWF? Historic Trust? Nope. Great. Well, that uh, ends our agenda. Is there any other business? There was no other business. So uh, with that, I will call this meeting to adjourn. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, Madam Clerk, thank you for your help uh, with the discussion today. and. County Administrator already left, but visit Pensacola, thank you.